What's up guys and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you guys are new here, then hello. My name is Erica and it's a pleasure to have you joining me today on the channel. For today's video, as you can see from the title, I am joined by my lovely friend Kelsey to review The Amber Fury by Natalie Haynes. Before we can get into that, just a bit about Kelsey. Kelsey is the face, the voice behind Bite-Sized Ancient History, which is a great online resource for all of you guys that are into classics and that are into Egyptology as well. Kelsey got her undergraduate degree from Warwick University in classics, and then she went on to do her master's in Egyptology from Cambridge. So we are in very, very good hands, especially considering that she now works for Classics for All. In case you guys haven't heard of Kelsey or Classics for All, all the links will be in the description below for you guys to click on and engage with at any point in this video or at the end. Whenever it is, do go down there and check out all of those links. But for now, you know, I know that people just come here because they want to hear us talk about a book. So Kelsey, why don't we hand this over to you to give us a breakdown of what exactly Amber Fury is about before we get into all of like the nitty gritty of what we thought and what we felt and any analysis we want to go into without spoiling it. Can you tell us very basically what is the book about? So Amber Fury is kind of laid out almost like a mystery and it focuses on the main character called Alex. And it starts with her preparing herself for a police investigation. And then we start to kind of learn as the reader over time, what this investigation is about. Literally from the beginning, all we know is that she has moved from London to Edinburgh to work as a teacher in a place called The Unit, which is like an establishment for bad students who have been kicked out of other schools. And as the teacher, she is a drama therapist for these students. And Natalie Haynes, the author, has kind of used these Greek plays to reflect what is happening in Alex's life and the student's life over time, split up into five acts for five different plays. And this over time reveals the mystery. So then right up off the bat, did you enjoy the book? Just like as a whole, not looking into the nitty gritty as a story, reading it from start to finish, was it enjoyable? I did really like it because I kind of, I chose this book because it's different from Natalie Haynes' other work where it's like your classic retellings of myths and stuff. I thought the way that she approached the use of classics was so different and made it quite an engaging narrative because it's not just focusing on, oh, Greek plays and the characters in it. It was using them as a tool to tell what would be a very standard non-classical book. And that was quite a nice change because I think obviously with our work, we read a lot of classics retellings. So it was quite refreshing. I was gonna say the same thing. Like I loved the approach that she took to this book and this was her first novel. Cause I think right before this she had done, if I'm not mistaken, it was like she did a kid's book and then she did the ancient guide to modern life. That was it. So nonfiction. And then she did this as her first fiction. And it, like you said, it was so different from the myth retellings. It wasn't like, here are the beats of the story. It's like, here are the things that if you're a classicist or if you're into this world are going to make this so much better, but you yeah. don't need it to really appreciate and have fun with the story that she told, especially because she picked all of these really interesting, like analytical plays. Like she wasn't just picking the famous ones. Like she picked yeah. some odd ones to throw in there. Like, I thought the use of Alcestis was like, or Alcestis, which one are we choosing to say? I, in my head, it's Alcestis, but we'll- Mine too, yeah. mine too. Okay. I say Alcestis. <laughs> I heard like two people on the internet say Alcestis. And since then I've been like, huh? <laughs> like, have I been saying Alcestis. it wrong? We're good, we're fine. But no, you're so right. It's kind of like that, if you know, you know, and it adds that level of depth to the characters and your understanding. But if you don't, you still read it like, any other fictional book and I think it was like a very cool way of bringing people into the classical world that may not know anything about it because you can be inspired to go oh I could learn more about this play to understand the book a little bit more in the characters 
100%. Like it was very much in keeping with, okay, not exactly the same. I don't want people to come for me in the comments. So hold off whilst I explain this, but it's very much in keeping with the secret history in the sense of she's telling yeah. a story, but that stuff is woven in. Nothing is going to match the secret history. And that's why I was like, hold off because we're not trying to compare the two at all. But stylistically, yes. they are the same. Like stylistically in the sense of the secret history, if you know the stuff that Donatart is tying into that, if you know the Plato moments that they're discussing in class and all of this, yeah. then you're going to get those scenes and be like, this is getting really dark very quickly if you're a classicist. And that's the same with this. Or again, you don't have to be a classicist, but just somebody who knows the plays or has read them or whatever. Same with this. Like as we go through the plays, they get increasingly darker. And so you are kind of like, okay, we've moved from very surface level, nice courtroom drama, you know, Eumenides kind of plays to Alcestis to Oedipus to, okay, now this is getting, <laughs> where are we going with this kind of a thing? I love it. And then it's like, if you do know the plays, you see this, like, you can kind of, tell what's coming next because you see the themes so like clearly outlined for each because well, so she split it up into five acts for each of the plays and I thought that was a really cool and interesting choice because you literally get the five themes outlined to you so I think it starts with Oedipus where she asks the students what they think about fate and if you believe in it if we're locked into it if you can change anything and that starts to make you question the students and the characters and you start to learn a bit more about Alex's idea of fate and her own misfortune. And then that's followed by Alcestis. Yeah, I don't actually like, remember the order. I was just like throwing the plays. I'm like, I remember them all being there, but I did read this like two months ago. <laughs> this is just, I've got it in front of me. It's fine. <laughs> I'm like, look down, check. it's fine. <laughs> no, and then it, I think Alcestis comes second. I may be wrong. We may be throwing it out there in the wrong order. But that I'm pretty of... sure you're right. Don't trust me, essentially. I know the plays that are involved and I know it gets increasingly darker. Yeah. But we're going to trust you. <laughs> it goes into then the idea of sacrifice because obviously in the play, she sacrifices herself for her husband so that he can survive. And then the third one, I think, is Agamemnon because it goes on to the Oresteia. Yeah. So then we get into the idea of revenge. So we're getting a lot darker a lot quickly as obviously <laughs> kills Agamemnon. And then Dibation Bearers, I think, is next. So it's the idea of obviously Orestes having these two awful choices like either way he is doing something wrong because is he avenging his father but then that means killing his mother and then the last one is Eumenides and then it's the idea of punishment and like retribution and it kind of just guides you through the narrative in this like very clear framework and telling you how to view and judge the actions that are happening in that chapter which I think is cool complete sidetrack I can't even remember what we were talking about <laughs> not a sidetrack at all because I mean the whole point of this book and the whole point of these discussions is also you kind of like pull out you know what are these books doing and why can we discuss them on the channel which is like modern ancients and so I'm always like pulling out what's the modern aspect of it and I think when it comes to this book I was actually surprised by how underrated it was like I tend to think like Natalie is on the pedestal that she's on for a reason. Like I've read her myth retellings and I'm like, okay, I get it. Like she's unbelievably clever. She knows exactly what she's doing. She not only is writing a narrative for everybody, but is also making it relevant to the modern world and picking yeah. the particular versions of each myth that, you know, are again, accurate and in the Greek, but that will reflect and that will sort of resonate with her current audience. She's brilliant. But this book I thought was so smart that I was really surprised that more people weren't talking about it just because of how popular books like The Secret History are. That mm. I was like, this is kind of, like I was saying, the same sort of style. I couldn't really figure out why people hadn't really gone back to read this one. Yeah, no, it, you're right. Because like, I would say Natalie Haynes is obviously one of those go-to names when you think of classical retellings. So it is interesting that people haven't gone back to this one. I think maybe the one thing when we talk about the secret history, it's obviously like on this untouchable podium. Of yeah, let's let's say that again, we, guys. I'm not saying Donna Tartt. We know how amazing at it all. is. <laughs> like, it's, not, it's fine. And I think almost it's because it has, the secret history created 
its own vibe and mm-hmm. style like it almost became an aesthetic in itself whereas I think maybe this book isn't as strong as that not to say like it's not as good it's just like it doesn't go as heavy in creating this different world whereas Secret History gives like the salt burn kind of vibes where people are on the outside looking in like oh I imagine what this world could be like this is very much more like the nitty-gritty because we're dealing with delinquent students like very normal people that have been thrown into just an abnormal situation yeah I mean that's also got me thinking as well like just again I keep wanting to stress we're not comparing the two in the sense of like why is it this regarded in the same way it's more so it's the same style so if something's worked why hasn't this worked and I think also when you're mentioning like delinquent students maybe that's also maybe this book is just a little bit too different for a lot of people. Like with the secret history, you go into Mm. it and there are all of these students, like they're students on campus. And even though, you know, like Bunny is this like wacko and uh, they're all weird characters and they're all Mm. basically caricatures. But you start off with like, here are people on campus. They all meet in the library. You know, they're things that people can put themselves into at the start of the story in order to then follow it and then go, holy moly, where is this going? What's happening? These are not the people that I knew. And we're kind of getting like Richard's perspective of that, even though he also is questionable in that story, (laughs) which is kind of the point. Um, But I think there's that like point of entry maybe with Donna Tartt that this book certainly doesn't have. You know, like this book, you're not really relating to Alex when you start reading it. You're intrigued by Alex, but you're not her. That is, yeah, no, that's exactly it. To be fair, because it is that slightly different style where it is a mystery book. So the way that we're hearing the narrative a lot of the time is her running over events in her head in order to explain it to an investigator, which I guess kind of separates you from it at times a little bit more than it does in The Secret History, I think could be a way of explaining it. Yeah, because also I think, again, just because we're talking about The Secret History, in that we know from the first line what we're building up to. So everyone's like, mm-hmm. okay, Bunny's dead. Like they tell you first line, Bunny's dead. Okay, how did he die? So you know that kind of end point. Whereas with this book, you don't know that end point. So yeah. like you said, it is still a mystery. You know something's happened because as you say, like we open and she's talking to an investigator mm-hmm. and literally the first opening chapter is like, I didn't know that these students were capable of this. I didn't know this is where it was going to go. You know, if I had spotted this, I could have done X, Y, and Z, but let me explain yeah. the story to you, right? And so that's how it opens. So you don't really know what's happened and as it goes through the story obviously you start to kind of piece things together and figure it out but even then at the end no spoilers guys don't worry but even at the end I was like oh shit I didn't actually realize it got that far yeah <laughs> you know that, uh, that was one bit that I really loved is like in the last two acts so like the last like quarter of the book the way that she uses like the acceleration of pace like to get you into it because I I read this all in like one day to like just get through it and I was like trying a little bit in the middle not because it was bad but just because I tried to read a book in one day but then like (laughs) the last two acts you feel like such acceleration and you're like oh my god this is suddenly like really kicked off like what is happening and I loved like the way she had done that stylistically and again again like her choice of plays in that respect really helps I just I I think that I'm just surprised because because like you said, there's just so much in this book. And like, we're really picking on like why people could possibly not like it. But I don't really know because I really enjoyed it. Like this is the exact yeah. book that like for someone, I guess, like us, who knows all the plays, who knows all this, like obviously reading retellings is good and both of us do it. Like we both do it all the time. We both love them. We love, you guys know I them. discuss them on the channel <laughs> and they're brilliant, but there is a certain degree of, okay, I know where this is going. You know, like every time I read a Clytemnestra retelling, I'm like, okay, just kill Agamemnon. Like, you know, I'm just like, (laughs) just get there. I don't know when we're going to get there, but like, hurry it up kind of thing because I know where it's going. Whereas this was infusing so much classics in it as the base and the story kind of exists above it, that it was so fun. And I found myself actually really trapped into this book being like, okay, if those are the themes that we're going for, I'm still trying to figure out how this is going to end. Like, what did these kids do? okay, maybe they did this. Oh no, but now we've moved on to this play. Okay, so then they didn't do 
that. Maybe they did something more like this and blah, blah, blah. Until you get to the end, you kind of come up with like three or four different ideas of what's happened. Of yeah. like, okay, what have they done? And just which one is Natalie going to go with? Which is fun. Like, it's so fun to read that. Like, it was such a fun and enjoyable experience at every single part of the book where I was trying to piece it together in my head and not just going, when is that person dying? When is that person getting yeah. stabbed? When is that person doing this? Which I do with every other retelling. No, no, it was, yeah, no, it was so engaging in that way. And I think also... Because it's mainly told, obviously, from Alex's point of view, the teacher. But it also drips in these diary entries from one of the students who becomes a key player. No spoilers. And as you, these just pop up kind of out of nowhere. They kind of fit into the general time period. But it doesn't, it's not necessarily like carrying on from where you've just left Alex's narrative. And each time they appear, you're like, oh, and you start to piece it together a little bit more from this different perspective. And you're kind of like, well, why? You kind of start to think, why are we reading this girl's diary entries? And you start to piece it together. You're like something, okay, she's important. What did she do? And it starts obviously very normal and then starts to spiral a little bit more. And it like, it like engages you in it because you are acting as the police detective trying to understand it. <laughs> 100% like I think that's such a key point like we're acting as the investigator which I think is a really brave choice for Natalie to take as like where to place her audience actually now thinking yeah. about it because normally what you would do is you would try to get your audience to relate to your main character even if it's not in first person right you want your your reader to go along with your main character and to follow them and to feel attached to them in some kind of way and I didn't think about it until you just said it. It's like, yeah, no, we're the investigators. So we're not with Alex. We're not with the students. We're not with the character that's writing the diary entries. We won't even tell you who that is. But you're not with any of them. You're kind of, it's almost like you have all of the evidence. Oh, that's actually really smart. You have all the evidence in front of you and you're being the investigator the whole yeah. time. Oh, that's brilliant. I know, I love it. And like, because like, it's such a bold, like an interesting choice because it instantly, it puts you on the outside of these characters. You're not relating to them. You at some points understand them, but because the mystery itself is so gripping, you don't feel that lack of character interaction because you you want to solve the mystery. It's like a, like a Midsummer Murders episode and it's great. <laughs> And also when it comes to all those individual characters, because, you know, the class that she teaches, again, audience is going to know this, but it's very small. And it's because they are this like delinquent school, I guess, if we're going to go with that, where it's like they've been kicked out of everything else. Nowhere else will literally take them. They have to go here. And there's possibility of them going to school after that, going to college after that. But they're kind of prepared to like school these kids up until they can leave and they can do whatever it was. But all of these students are so different and they're so easy to like hear speak and that was something I really liked about the way that she wrote this is that mm -hmm. I got to know all of them so well and also like what all of them wanted to do after school or even the ones who like maybe you don't know currently what they're doing they're acting out and so it's like okay well they're struggling with something maybe they don't know their next step but they're doing this and they were all such interesting people in of themselves and also yeah. through that when you're uncovering the mystery, you're kind of like, who's at fault here? Because I can pin it on any of them and give them a good reason to do it. And mm -hmm. kind of the way that she's gone about the story is almost eliminating all of them as well. Where it's like, here are all of these troubled people, which is why they've ended up in the position that they're in. Here's their background. They're all violent. Like every single mm -hmm. one of them is physically violent. So you know, like, okay, well, they're all problems. But who is the one that's done this one thing that's causing the story? Yeah. To yeah, unfold. no, exactly. They all have the potential to do something bad, which could lead to an investigation. But you still feel she's really good at writing the empathy that you feel for these, like, children. And I quite like, I don't know if you read the afterword, and it talks about the importance of classics in the way that we can actually use it with children like this and how we can relate to it and understand it a bit more. And I thought that was another really clever aspect of the book because it's not, she doesn't ram it down your throat like preaching, oh my God, classics is so important, we can save people with it. But it's like this underlying message of, we're getting these children who from the very beginning, 
they enter the classroom, they're swearing at Alex. They don't want to be there. They don't want to learn. And then as we go through each of the play, they become more and more engaged and more open about their own experiences. And as you said, talking about their futures and like, oh my God, that conversation where they start talking about how much they've like planned what they want to do because you don't, you don't think they have, which sounds awful, but you think, no, they're just these delinquent students. They're violent. They don't do anything where they've all like planned their future to a T. They have like the steps lined up. They know what they want to do. And you're like, Oh, oh, the businesses they want to run, like all of these things. Yeah. We're like, wow, they're really ambitious kids. They're like anybody else. And you're like, oh, damn, okay. <laughs> See, I think maybe this book, like in order for it to have succeeded, I think, you know, something that was said to me when I first started this channel was by Scarlett St. Clair, who wrote A Touch of Darkness and that whole series. But at the time, and I always like stress this whenever I talk about Scarlett, when Scarlett and I spoke, no one gave a shit about her books. No one gave a shit about my channel. Like it was just one of those things where I think she had like 2000 followers on Instagram. I didn't even have a thousand subscribers. So it was like, oh, this is a really great match kind of a thing. And then she popped off like eight months later or something. So it wasn't even like after our video. But at the start, I remember asking her like, oh, you know, what made you change the way that you write? Because she's always loved myths. And she used to just do like more, not traditional retellings, but make them more subtle, like make all of her inspired books much more subtle like her first book which is a YA book that one actually was like really subtle classics vibes in it I still have one of those first things and she like first publications of it and she then ended up going back into it and changing it drastically because what she said was that she had much more confidence that people knew classics than they actually did and mm -hmm. as soon as she said that to me, it was something I realized that I did. It's something that I realized that all of us kind of do, that we just assume because we're really into this thing, everybody else is. And I think that that goes for anything. This is just a particular, you know, niche. But I think with anything, you know, people assume everybody knows a lot more about Star Wars or knows a lot more about Lord of the Rings or whatever. And so you assume that something is going to work. You assume that something yeah. is going to be popular because you're in the environment. And I think that might be the case with this book where it's like, this book, at the time it was published, you know, I mean, Nassie had already published a nonfiction book. This was really like, you know, I mean, Mary Renault had obviously already done her stuff. Madeline Miller was doing her thing. So Nassie's like, ah, oh, people are ready for this because now they're familiar with Greek myths or they're familiar with these ancient Greek plays that all of us have been privileged enough to study or to come to this channel to learn about and all of this because we found it. But so many people haven't. So she released this book being like, people are ready for it, not realizing that the audience was this big at the time and that actually nobody had really found this stuff. Nobody really knew about it. And this book is fantastic, but it requires this much knowledge from mm. people to want to pick it up, if that makes mm. sense. Like you have to have heard about these plays or know about classics to like kind of get into it. Mm -hmm. I think anyways, not necessarily to know about them because you don't need the plays, she explains them. But there is that barrier to entry where you see like, oh, ancient Greek theater. Nope, put it down. Mm. And I think that's what this book might be suffering from. It was a bit too early and there was too much assumption that people were like, yes, I know these people. Whereas now it would do, like if, if she dropped this next year, it would do really well. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, 100%. No, I think you could be onto something. Yeah, no, I think that sounds about right. I suppose you could also look at it the other way that maybe that's the reason that she didn't go in straight away for a classical retelling is because she's used a different, more popular genre as a vehicle to explore classics, even though it necessarily didn't work at the time. Like maybe that was her thought process of like, maybe I can't go in straight away with pure classics. Does that make sense? A thousand percent. Like, and I definitely yeah. think that was also like a publisher's perspective from it. Yeah. That like the publisher's going, who the, who the hell is going to read a retelling? Maybe if you do it this way, it'll work. Because also, I mean, The Secret History came out in 1992. So that worked really well. And they were like, cool, do something. Maybe it was like, you know, if you do something more like that, just because they are so similar, yeah. it's like, maybe that was the pitch that Natalie was like, I have all of this classics background and I did this nonfiction, but I want to do fiction. And they're like, huh, that's great. But also, who you know, are we yeah. selling to? Yeah, who are yeah. we selling to? Yeah. We only have like three examples of this working. Whereas we know that this genre as a whole works really well. Like make it sort of gothic, make it dark, make it academia, brilliant, yeah. go that route. And it just didn't hit. So I completely agree. I don't think that it was all nasty. I think that there was so many components to it. And I think as well, like, I mean, I don't know about you, but when I started, I was certainly thinking that too. I was like, oh, let me go into like all of these 
you know, regular things like the Hunger Games or whatever, mm-hmm. not realizing that the market wasn't ready for it yet. Again, it is now, but it wasn't there. But I think all of us went into it with the same idea and we're all kind of proved wrong, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it definitely comes from like you assume a level of like knowledge from everyone you're like oh yeah no I wouldn't everybody know all of this and then yeah it's the kind of the same way that you get proved wrong every time like if you watch I was watching the Alexander series on Netflix with my flatmates yeah I haven't um, seen it yet okay we need to discuss this <laughs> <laughs> you assume like they know everything that's being said in the documentary and then they'll say something you'd be like no where have you got that from <laughs> like and you're right like you kind of when you are passionate about something and you start writing or making content about it you forget to take a step back sometimes and be like no not everybody cares a lot of people don't care (laughs) well yeah no but I think that's such a key point like a lot of people don't care and like I think one thing that clearly Natalie and her publishers have done is realize okay well how do we get people to care Mm -hmm. you know and so Natalie was like okay great I can write a really good retelling of Jocasta this is Oedipus. It's a really popular story. I can do this. We know it hits. Yeah. Why don't we give this a go? And so they were being really brave and it's like, well, let's try this. But you have to like, again, I think everybody goes in with the same mentality, which is, oh, we'll just do it this way and this will work. And it's never that way. Yeah. No, definitely. Agreed. (laughs) (laughs) So, okay. If we're talking directly to the audience now and people who come to my channel are I mean, they're kind of like how your viewers were as well. So they're all just, they're nuts. They've come here because they're like, ah, oh, I love this stuff. So who is the person that would pick up this book that you would say, if you're walking around Waterstones Piccadilly with them, we'll just pick like the biggest one. You're walking around the shop. Who is that person that you're standing with that then you go, oh my God, read Amber Fury. Ooh, so we're talking about people that already know about classics. Yes. Would- so like if we're going to recommend... Mm to the ideal buyer of this, who would it be? So I think the ideal buyer, anybody that's interested in classics, obviously, and then people that like Greek myths and plays, because I think it's just a way of, it's more engaging than typically reading the plays themselves. Um, But then also, I don't think you necessarily, like we said, you don't need to be a historian or a classicist to want to pick it up. I would suggest it to lots of friends who don't know about it. I'd be like, oh, you really like true crime. You really like mysteries. I think you would really enjoy this. Like, I don't think you necessarily need to be a classicist in order to be somebody who I'd recommend reading it. Well, (laughs) definitely. I would say probably my ideal person, if I'm walking around, is the person who this is going to come off wrong, but I need everybody to like bear with me. I always just say things and they always come off as really rude. The person that's exhausted by retellings, like that's the person that I, as I'm walking around with, if somebody is like, oh, I've read Costanza, I've read Jennifer's, I've read even, you know, Elodie's historical fiction books. I've read all of those. I'd be like, yeah, okay, no. great. I don't need to give you another retelling because you already know how to do that. Perfect. I'm going to bring you to this new section and say, hey, maybe you're not into crime. Maybe you're not really into this or you haven't gotten to explore it by yourself, but try it. It's mm-hmm. something new. It's keeping with the themes that you're familiar with and it's just exploring them in a different way. That would be the next book that I gave them. It would be somebody who's already- That's your show. You know, like familiar. Or like somebody like burn out, like while they're still studying and they're like, I do not want to see it anymore. And you're like, okay, but I know you still like it. Like here's how to like rediscover that passion a little bit. <laughs> Hundred percent. Like that's something that I always say about um, uh, Alex Michelides' books. Mm-hmm. So he does people who don't know. I scream about his books all the time because I think they're brilliant. But he does like Agatha Christie meets Greek tragedy books, and they are just incredible. And people in classics don't scream about them enough. But it's because he's layered them so subtly that they are just crime books. Like you will yeah. never find them in a retelling part. Like they don't even have it on the back. It's really just like, it's kind of there. Not as prominent as this, but I always say like to people who are burnt out by retellings or burnt out by their studies or whatever, I'm like, if you want something new and fresh, but a little bit familiar, go to him. And I think I would put this in that category, though the mystery isn't as 
like the way that Alex McLeodies writes is so crazy in like the most brilliant way. Like you're following the story going, where is he going? How did it turn there? What's happening there? I scream at his books in the most like complimentary way because <laughs> I'm so stressed and I'm like, how did this happen? <laughs> like what is happening? And so even though this book doesn't have that reaction, I would slump it in with that. I would be like, here are all of these vibes. Ah, oh, that's what it is. Here are all these vibes books. Okay. No, I like that. No, I think it, yeah. I do, yeah, no, I had another thought. If it was like people specifically like classicists, people like watching this, and I went through this, like when you finished your undergraduate, your master's, you don't want to look at it anymore you're like I am so like it's like trauma triggering thinking about anything after you've like submitted your final dissertation and stuff but you don't want to lose it you're like I still love it but right now it's giving me a panic attack like I can't really handle you I feel like this is a book I would suggest to them a couple of months down the line being like we can bring you back into it it's a safe space we'll just disguise it as a mystery and then we'll get the little hints where you could be like okay we're safe we're okay babes like <laughs> classics vibes these this is like I have a whole video on like classics vibes books where I'm like they're not retellings but they have classics in them but they're also like not classics at all I'm like it's just like a weird vibe that's in there that you'll get if you study but if not you're not really missing anything like I threw like Piranesi in there where I'm like yeah <laughs> kind of <laughs> yeah. and they're like books like that that is 100% exactly what you're just saying like this would be slotted into that category where I'm like it's in this weird bucket that I swear is really intriguing if you start reading this shit but not trauma inducing <laughs> not like oh my god not again like not again. which I feel like if you're going straight back into the retellings are oh, because you're like oh my god I need to analyze it still like you're still you're in that analytical mindset of which interpretation of this what is this <laughs> is this accurate and you're like Jesus where is this because it is just the vibe and like hints of it you don't feel the need to slip into like student brain to analyze mm -hmm. it, which mm -hmm. is really nice. You can just relax with it, which rare, like love it. No, hundred percent. That's what I do with um, Alex McLeodes' books as well, that I enjoy them so much because I'm not going into it in the same way that you're saying, like for my videos, I'm like, which version are we going with? Is this a true representation of the character? Is this fictionalized? Is this real? What did she make up? What is necessary or what did he make up? Whatever. Literally, like you said, that part just gets switched off and you're just like, is it good? <laughs> like, like, that's is the good only story? question. <laughs> is it a good story? It's got the vibes. Great. Yeah. Am I having fun? No, then I can put this book down. That's fine. But if I am having fun, which I do with all of those books, I'm like, ah, oh. and I can appreciate the writing so much more in them. Like when I do retellings, I'm like, okay, obviously this is beautifully written. Now let's see all these checkboxes that we're going through. Whereas with these, I can read, like, I think this is the book that really made me appreciate how good of a writer Natalie yeah. is. Like how yeah. talented she is at what she does. Because, you know, as we've been saying, like I was totally taken by the story, but it was because of that ability to switch it off. Yeah, no, exactly. It lets you immerse yourself in it a little bit more as a classicist or historian because you're not looking to judge if it's correct or not, <laughs> which is nice. Um, yeah, no, so definitely it's for people like that are burnt out from the classics genre and you just want to keep your little toes in it. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to end the video than there. So actually we're just going to cut off the conversation here. <laughs> thank you, Kelsey, for joining me on the channel today. And thank you to everybody at home who's watching, who's engaging with this content. It means the world that everybody, you know, guest and audience are taking the time out of their day to hop on and to be on this little nerdy corner of the internet. If you haven't already joined us, then please hit the subscribe button, smash that bell icon so that you guys are always in the know of when I post next. And of course, the links to Amber Fury, if you guys wanted to buy it, are in the description below, along with all of the links to Classics for All, as well as Kelsey's bite-sized ancient history content. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and we'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on Monink. So I'll see you guys then.